We're Compound Everything and we talk money, markets and investing and we're just back from the Berkshire Hathaway 2023 annual meeting and today is Tuesday, May the 9th. Yeah, so we're fresh off the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting and it was a lot of fun. I really enjoy the meeting every year. It was, it's a great time just to meet people and to get along with you know, like-minded individuals. We met a number of people there. Who... We met a lot of people. Yeah. We met more people this year than in priors. I think we made more of a effort to make sure we talked to like everyone that we were around. Yeah. One of the things I noticed this year is it's bigger than we've seen before. So we've been three times mm -hmm. now. So one of the things that stood out to me, yeah, was just the size of it this year. Mm -hmm. So usually we line up nice and early, like 4 a.m. This year we decided mm -hmm. to sleep in a little bit, got there around 6 and the line was really long. <laughs> so I was thinking about that. Our first year was in 2018. Yeah. We missed 2019. Then, of course, we had the two years online. Yeah. And then we were back last year and again this year. But 2018, we did get there at four in the morning. And there was already a long line. It was a pretty long line. line. So I don't know if it was busier than 2018. So last year was a bit of an anomaly, though, I guess, because, you know, half the world still wasn't able to travel. Mm -hmm. And so... It was noticeably busier this year than it was last year. Yeah. For the people who have never been, um, what does it look like when you get there? Well, when you get there at 4 a.m. and you get there at 6 a.m., it looks different. Very much so. At 4 a.m., it's already busy. Yeah. You have the people who have camped out yeah. all night. They bring their chairs, and then when the doors open, they just, they leave, just their, leave their lawn chairs. Their lawn chairs. <laughs> and then you can get very close to the door. I want to say within 20 people for sure if you get there at 4 a.m. At some door, it's going to be pretty empty. Yeah. When you get there at 6 a.m., then you wait a little while to yeah. line up. So the doors typically open at 7 a.m. Mm -hmm. And so people literally just flood in and run. Um, it's a you know, stampede. It's a stampede. So there's metal detectors there and whatnot. So you got to pass through some metal detection. But once you're through, you run. You go find as best as you can. You're not supposed you to run. <laughs> they, they tell you not to run, but people do it anyways. Yeah. It's a bit, of a, a bit of a stampede. It was actually funny because we listened to a pod on the way home, uh, the investing podcast. Yeah. And I can't remember who the guest was, but he has been investing in Berkshire since 20, uh, 2000. since 2000, yeah. right, since 2000. He got it pretty cheap at that time. And he was saying that he went to his first meeting mm. way back uh, at 2000 or 2001 or something when it was still at the small convention center. Yeah. It hadn't moved over to CHI or the small arena. Yeah. And he was saying they lined up, they did, you know, all of that. And he's there and everyone at that time's old. So he said he's in a sea of like white hair. And they have I think their you said walk, white and blue hair. White and blue hair. And they had their walkers. Yeah. And he said, you never seen them move so fast. <laughs> and he said the doors open and these people were running in and Buffett actually would stand and shake your hand at that time. But right. they were just so focused on getting in, they'd blow right past him. And he said it was at that moment he realized he joined. He's like, oh my goodness, I've joined a cult. So it's actually a really fun time. So basically the festivities start out on a Friday. Mm -hmm. So when you arrive there on Friday at around noon, there's a marketplace that opens. And a lot of the Berkshire subsidiaries um, will have stands there. So mm -hmm. BNSF will have a stand. Seize Candies, which is always a major draw, has a large stand. Brooks Shoes. Uh, Brooks Shoes. Jets. Net Jets, which is always neat. So you can go and look at all these different you know, sampling of products that they have and whatnot. You go buy Seize Candy. There's a really good book uh, area there that... Oh, yeah, that's a fun area. So that's it's always, always crammed. Always crammed, always packed. This year they had uh, squash mellows. Yes. You can see right there. Yes. And so uh, that's part of their uh, purchase of Allegheny. They got... Yes. Uh, I can't remember the company's name that makes these squash mellows, but they're quite popular as well. We yeah. waited literally an hour and a half in line to pick up uh, our kids some squash balls. Well, we wanted to get, they had a special edition Pikachu and Gengar, yes. uh, which are Pokemon. We wanted to get those for our kids. We ended up getting the Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett squash mallow because the Pokemon ones were all sold Yes, out. yes. While we were in line, actually, just, this just goes to show you the, the culture of Berkshire Hathaway. While we were in line, we actually met one of the directors of Berkshire Hathaway. Mm -hmm. She waited in line with us. She was right behind us. She so was right behind us. We had shareholders who actually lived in Omaha who were yep. really interesting to talk to, two lawyers uh, in front of us. Yeah. And then right behind us was this other woman and we asked her, oh, where, she's, where are you from? And yep. she said, Florida. And then we got talking and then you noticed her tag. Her tag, it said director. Yeah. And I asked her, I said, oh, you're a director. You're a director of Berkshire Hathaway. She said, yes, yes, I am. And it, I just thought to myself, wow. And we stood in line with her for literally like an hour and a half. Yeah, like you think you would, she would be able to, you know, call in in favor and say like, she was with her son yeah. and call in a favor and be like, oh, my son wants a Warren Buffett squash mallow. Can I just like get one? But she waited. She waited in line with us. So yeah. it just tells you the culture of Berkshire Hathaway mm -hmm. that 
you know, everyone's kind of treated equal. Mm -hmm. We're we're kind of minor shareholders and she's a director of the corporation Mm -hmm. and she's sitting there or standing there in line with us waiting for this, this product. Having a pleasant conversation. We're talking about the weather. We're talking about the differences between our countries. Yeah. The group of us, you know, shot the breeze for like an hour and a half, which was amazing. When you go to the meeting, that's exactly what you see. You'll see you know, best investors that you'll know very well. Apparently Manesh Prabhai was there. We didn't see him. Yeah. Last year we saw Mario Gabelli yeah. there. Um, and so you just see, you know, directors and managers just walking around. Mm-hmm. It's it's quite something actually. And mm-hmm. then of course the news media is all there and, and whatnot. And it's, it's it's just a really neat, really neat culture. I think it just yeah. speaks to the culture of what is Berkshire Hathaway yeah. that, you know, there's really no preferential treatment and they view their shareholders as fellow owners. So let's go into the meeting and discuss our biggest takeaways and mm-hmm. what we learned from the 2023 annual meeting. Charlie Munger's 99. Yes. So, you know, you don't there we don't know how many more meetings there will be with, with both Buffett and Munger at the table. I right. noticed he got wheeled out in his wheelchair this year. I think last year they wheeled him to the curtain yeah. and he walked, but this year they wheeled him all the way to the table. Yeah. So He's obviously feeling the effects of living an entire century. <laughs> Rightly so. <laughs> and I think, you know, physically he seems to have slowed down, but cognitively he's still sharp. Yeah. And so they really fielded questions for had to be the better part of five or six hours. So I really appreciate that Greg Abel and Ajit Jain are now at the table. And they've done mm, that yeah. for a few years. And uh, it's nice that they're bringing them to answer questions before Munger and Buffett leave. So it's kind of like it's going to be a smooth transition. Mm -hmm. Now we know that Abel's going to be a successor because they've mentioned that. Ajit, maybe not, but he's obviously very important in the runnings of the company, particularly on the insurance side. Mm -hmm. Uh, One thing that sticks out to me is when they were asked about BNSF, which is their rail, Mm -hmm. and they had gone through, I guess, First Nations reservation area, Mm -hmm. and they had broken a contract Mm -hmm. for it. And I... And, you know, a lot of people would spew a lot of things, a lot of CEOs, a lot of directors would say a lot of things without saying nothing, say as many words as possible to confuse the person who asked the question. Right, just obfuscate. Right, wax eloquent just to avoid it. And he actually said, yeah, we we did that. We made a mistake. We weren't supposed to take that many cars through. And we work with them to rectify the situation. Mm -hmm, So mm -hmm. he didn't try to dance around the mistake that they made. So I, I appreciated that on Greg Abel's part. Another comment that I kind of my ears perked up was when Charlie Munger said value investors have to get used to getting smaller returns. Mm, yeah. But then Buffett was like, Charlie, you say that every year. So right. I was like, okay, but that made me think about it. So I was interested in that comment, kind of want to think on that and look into that a little bit. There was a question that actually stood out to me was when uh, someone asked, they said they were listening to a podcast and the particular guest on the podcast said that it was very risky for Berkshire to have Apple weighted at 40% in their port. And what was their response to that? And Buffett just shut that down. Yeah. Or not Buffett, Munger. Munger. was like, that. first of all, that's not true. Right. He said it's not true. And then he went on about that. But then he also said, even if it was weighted 40%, right. what would be the big deal? Right. Who cares? It's a great company. He's like, why would we... Why would we get rid of it to put our money in something that might not be as good? Right. So it was interesting that A, he shut that notion down because I see a lot of posts and slides and people who always have Berkshire's portfolio mm-hmm. and they say, oh, 40% of Berkshire's money is wrapped up in Apple or whatever. Um, and so he shut that down. But then also he just went on to say like, you know, massive diversification is not how you're going to get exceptional gains. And why right. on earth I take money out of the best company in, you know, just so I can be diversified to get a worse return. Right. So why the, the point being, why would he sell a great company and put it into Maybe a good company. Mm-hmm. What's the point of that? Yeah, it, it exactly. doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And yeah, I think it's hard to know whether or not that investor was maybe. I don't know the quote where the original quote mm-hmm. came from, but as it was read, it did insinuate mm-hmm. that yeah, this person was, I guess, attacking the fact that Apple was yeah. comprising almost forty percent of Berkshire's yeah. holdings, and they said holdings basically, holdings, which was in, you know in fact not true. And like you said, Charlie Munger shut that down. Their investment portfolio, yes, you know. So I, I ran some of the numbers actually. Yeah. Which I think maybe we'll do a whole. Let's do a whole video on that next week. Sure. Okay. Yeah, we'll we'll do a little video on that next week. On but all I, their holdings and all their subsidiaries and all well, of that. Well, 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 we'll just maybe we'll address this one question. Mm-hmm. Actually, just maybe we'll address this one question as to, you know, what does that look like and why is that maybe a mistake right. to think that Apple actually 
represents 40% of their holdings. Right. And why did they shut it down so fast? Yes. Like there was no hesitation in shutting that down. They didn't even, he didn't even need to think. He knew how their portfolio looked. And right. he was like, that's wrong. Right. So I think that was a very interesting, interesting mm -hmm. point. All right. So just launching off your point about Apple that was made. One of the things that they had mentioned is that you can only own 100% of any business, mm -hmm. which you kind of think about, well, of course, that's true. But one of the reasons they used to defend that position and why, you know, why own Apple as a, as a, such a large of, portion, a large portion of the portfolio, they said, look, if we buy a business outright, that's, we can only own 100% of it. And that's the most. Now, Apple's been doing a large amount of share repurchases, mm -hmm. a large amount. So basically what's been happening is over time, they've been able to accumulate a greater percentage of ownership of Apple shares and of Apple, the Apple company itself just through sitting there doing nothing. Right. So the, their point is, why wouldn't we want to do that? Apple's a great business. And they went to the point of saying that people love their phones. Right. And he said that, I think the exact example he used, he said people would rather get rid of a second car, given the choice of having a second car or getting rid of their Apple phone, they would forego a second car. Yeah. And he said, that's a huge mode. Yeah. Right. So you've got this business that attracts people. They've got this uh, ecosystem there that just works. He said, why wouldn't we want to own a business like this? And to your point earlier, why would we divest such a business in order to buy one that's more mediocre? Right. It just doesn't make any sense. No, exactly. Yeah. Now, I don't remember who made this point, but one of the things that stood out to me as well is that either Munger or Buffett referenced Ben Graham. And they, they often reference yeah. Ben Graham in their annual meeting. But one of the things that they said is, the, I think he said the more than 50% of the wealth that Yes. Ben Graham made was through one investment. Mm -hmm. One. Yeah. And that was Geico. Yeah. Which was a growth stock at the time. And along with that point, he said, you have to be as an investor skilled enough to ignore the number of salesmen that come along. Oh, yeah. And so, there's a lot of salesmen. And there's a lot That's of salesmen. That's the number one job at the front office. Right. In a, in a bank or, or in a financial institution. The well, Pretty much portfolio management and sales. Mm-hmm are the jobs of the front office. Yeah. Well, and oftentimes CEOs get to that position. Why? Because they're good salesmen. Mm -hmm. They can sell the product and they can mm -hmm. sell themselves. Yep. So at that point, you know, you have to be able to kind of resist, mm -hmm. you know, every business looks great when, this, when the, the CEO comes along and talks to you. They can sell you on almost anything. Right. So the point being is, um, I think the takeaway was, Ignore salesmen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, really do a deep dive. And I think it's Peter Lynch who says he doesn't even like talking to the management for that reason. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then the other thing is one stock can make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And I think even for Berkshire, Charlie and Warren would say that the vast majority of the, the holdings of Berkshire, the, the wealth that Berkshire's generated, has probably come from only a handful of, of stock picks. Mm -hmm. I think they said maybe 10 or 12. Yeah. And so really, at the end of the day, you know, Picking one or two, you know, good stocks can really make a difference in yeah. the end. I think too, if you if you extrapolate a little further on the Ben Graham point with Geico, that's another example, and we've talked about this before, where value and growth are tied at the hip. Yes, they are. Because it was a growth company, mm -hmm. but he didn't overpay for it. No, he didn't overpay for it, and yeah. that's the thing. And he knew the company really well. Yeah, and he knew the company really well. And to go even further, a lot of big value guys made their money in insurance they did yeah well if you think of you know warren buffett and berkshire yeah you think of ben graham ben graham the davises yeah but there's question. a few of them but there's definitely a few yeah and geico it's funny because actually that was a little bit of a sore spot for mm. one of the davis i uh, i can't remember if it was uh i think it was shelby it was shelby davis yeah, yeah. that was because he sold and he regretted it yeah and, yeah and warren buffett kind of came in and scooped up shares scooped on up the cheap. shares and he's like well had i known and and, that, yeah. and he was too bitter to ever buy back which yeah. always reminds me like don't let emotions get in the way of and they they addressed that point specifically yeah actually not about davis but they said yeah. don't be emotional in investing yeah they, they said, said never never someone said have you ever made a investment based on emotion and charlie thing was like never yeah. So you just got to take <laughs> I don't know emotion if out of it. Has any emotion. <laughs> that's a good that's a good point. But one of the other things just to your going back to the prior point is we were listening to a podcast on the way home. We had a lot of time in the car on the way mm -hmm. home. But uh, I think it was uh, Tom Gaynor from Markel who mm -hmm. said don't interrupt the compounding machine. Yeah. Don't interrupt it. And that's one of the things that Berkshire's been 
able to do is once they have a good company, they just let it run. Yeah. Geico, Apple. So Geico, Apple, uh, American Express, Coca-Cola. They didn't sell them. Mm-hmm. And Tom Gaynor himself said he was tempted to sell Home Depot or calls against Home Depot at one point. Covered calls. Covered calls. Yeah. And he said if he had done that, the he talked himself out of it, but the shares would have been called away. And this was back in 2011. He would have missed phenomenal growth in 2011 I think the majority of his growth in Home Depot. Yeah. And that's when he said, do not get in the way of the compounding machine. Right. So I think that's one of the strengths that Berkshire's had going back is they've never interrupted that content compounding machine. Mm-hmm. And I just thought that was a great way to put yeah. it that Tom Gaynor um, said there. So Yeah, and on that note too, uh, Buffett was saying there's a lot of ways to invest and a lot of people do different things. He said, you do not have to participate in every area of investing. Yeah, that was a good point right? too. And that's yeah. true too because different people are good at different things. Right. So there are, there are many ways to make money in the market. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's momentum investing, there's quantum investing, mm-hmm. whatever. And then there's you know value investing yeah. or GARP, I would say more so is yeah. what. Uh, Buffett and Munger do, but he said you don't have to participate in that. That's okay. No. You can you you are working on a different plane. Mm-hmm. You're not doing that, and you right. don't need. You know they'll make money, and that's fine. But you are not doing that. You do not need to participate in that. Right. I'm going to quote Tom Gaynor again because yeah. I think it was just so profound, and it leaps off this point exactly. It's funny when you when you listen to all these guys, they all have very similar thoughts. Mm-hmm. But Tom Gaynor compared himself, in a sense, to running with Usain Bolt. Yes. And he said like. You know, if you were to challenge, if I were to challenge Usain Bolt to a 100 meter dash, he's like, you should bet every time heavily, like your whole net worth on Usain Bolt because I'm never going to win. No, ever. Right? Mm-hmm. And he said, even at 200 meters, mm-hmm. same thing. 400 meters, same thing. You know, a 5K run, maybe, but he'll, but he'll still, put your money put, on- still put your money on Usain Bolt. But he said, if you had a race, a foot race from one side of America to the other, he's like, then I might have a chance. Yeah, I might have a chance. I might have a chance, mm-hmm. you know. And then he, he said at that point, and his analogy was that you can't, or he can't trade against these quick, you know, turnaround day traders. There's um, a lot of people day who traders. are smarter in right. the market than him. There are a lot of people who have better tech right, than he has he available to him. Mm-hmm. And he's like, my my job is just to show up yeah. and not blow up. And not blow up. Basically. That was the big thing. You have to show up and not blow up. Right. So don't lose, you know, as Warren Buffett rule would say, one. rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two. Don't forget rule number one. Mm-hmm. And so the point being is, if you just show up and are consistent day after day after day, just what, put one foot after another, you'll get to the end of the race. And that is what Berkshire has done. Right. Yeah. And the other thing about, and, and you can see this woven throughout every annual meeting, but what you really realize, and I said just a few minutes ago that they're kind of like value investors or GARP, but they're really just opportunistic investors. Very much so. Like they do things all over the place. If it's a deal, he's going to take it. Oh, he's going to take it, yeah. he can get, you know... A ten dollar bill for five bucks. He's taking that deal every day. Every day. Yeah, no yeah. question. And that's what they've done over and over and over mm-hmm. again. And then they've left them alone. One young guy got up, and I actually think he was from Canada. I'm pretty sure. But oh yeah, I know the question. He got up mm-hmm. and he asked, "Why on earth would managers want to work for Berkshire Hathaway? Why do these managers want to work for them? Don't they want to just run their own business? Don't they want autonomy? Right. You know, and whatnot in today's age of entrepreneurial spirit and all right. of that." And I thought their answer was good. And I kind of was laughing at the question because it's easy for a young guy to get up and say, I don't want to sell my business, right. you know, and be an employee at Burke. Right. But he, he said, there's a lot of reasons they, they don't want to deal with the capital. They don't mm-hmm. want to deal with the analysts. They don't want to deal with investors. Right. Maybe they just, they just love their, they want to run the business. They're good at that, but they don't want to do everything else. Right. <clears throat> and I thought that is and I was thinking about it while he was answering it, and I thought one of the reasons, too, why these managers or why these people are, are okay with Berkshire buying their companies is because Berkshire leaves them alone. Yeah. They take care of all the things that they might not want to do. Right. Having, being bus- like, having that entrepreneurial mm-hmm, spirit, mm-hmm. and they let them just run the business. Yeah. Well, for instance, Allegheny was a publicly traded company. Mm-hmm. Publicly traded companies have a lot of listing requirements. They have a lot of rules they have to mm-hmm. follow. And so when a company is taping in private... Those go away. Yeah. And so the the manager, the CEO or whatnot, the founder can just focus on doing what they love, which is running the business. Exactly. Rather than jumping through regulatory hurdles and hoops. Yeah. You know, so that's just one hurdle that's removed for them. Yeah. And I, I appreciated that question because I feel sometimes that 
in today's day and age, we're really obsessed with working for yourself and being an entrepreneur and all mm-hmm. of that. But not everyone is cut out for that. Right. And I think it sometimes makes young people, like if they're not that type of person, yeah. some people like having it, you know, they like to clock in, clock out. They don't want to worry. They don't want to be the guy at the top having the headache, going to bed at night. I'm going to get paid for this. This person right. stiffed me on. Yeah. Payment, you know, they get paid no matter what. And I think sometimes we do a disservice to the younger generation when we keep focusing on there's only one way to make money or mm-hmm, this is mm-hmm. the best way because that's not true. No. You can you can own a business by buying shares. Yep. You can have a nine to five. Yep. You know, you can clock in, clock out if that works better with your personality. And you can still be what we call an equity piggy yep. by gobbling up shares in good companies. It doesn't yep. mean you need to actually start a business or run a business or put up with all the headache of starting right. that. Oh yeah, no question. And I think that's maybe one of the reasons why you know, managers and, you know, founders and mm-hmm. CEOs and whatnot like to sell the Berkshire mm-hmm. because it's their baby. They want to see it run well, manage yeah. well, and there's opportunity for them to continue to do it because usually Berkshire right. just leaves them alone. And they can, and they can be business owners in owning Berkshire. The nice thing about going to these meetings is that you get to hear the, I'm glad they had that question at being asked mm. in the queue because you get to hear their answers and it, you can extrapolate a lot from the Q and A part because there's just so much wisdom there. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was a good question to allow in the queue. Oh, no question. Speaking, going back again to not interrupting the compounding machine. That's yeah. one of the things that like, I think I took away from this. Now, Charlie Munger mentioned a story about how he bought uh, oil royalties in the oh, past. Oh, yes. So this really stood out to me. I think he mm-hmm. said it was 40 some odd years ago that he bought these oh, well, that's... oil royalties, maybe 50 years ago. I mean, he's really old, so it yeah. <laughs> could have been either of the two. Yeah. But he bought oil royalties in somewhere in Texas. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know the particulars. But what struck out or stuck out to me is that he bought these oil royalties for $1,000. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's a share or, or what, what it was exactly, what the unit is. But now each of those royalties is paying him $70,000 a year, mm-hmm. just a check to his door, mm-hmm. never sold it, right? So don't, again, going back to that point of don't interrupt the compounding machine. Invested $1,000, gets $70,000 like clockwork every year. Yeah. Don't interrupt it. You find a good business or you know a good revenue stream, leave it alone. Mm-hmm. Now, would could he have pictured what the world would look like you know 50 or 60 years from when he bought it or you know, 40 or 50 years from when he bought it probably not but he thought well this is a good deal at the time mm-hmm. and it's you know paying cash flow and proven you know, to be a good deal. proven to be a good deal so i think yeah. he just jumped on it yeah. I, again i can't comment on it too much but i mean at the it end was of a it, small comment. It, it was a small comment but it really stuck to me you know again yeah. don't interrupt that compounding yeah. machine and the other thing too is he would say he wouldn't have been able to predict where the world would be at 50 years because someone asked them you know where do you think we're going to be 50 years from now that was a a question that was a question and they said i don't know well i think they do try and forecast maybe five or ten years out because they mentioned that for apple can Mm -hmm. we forecast where apple will be five or ten years from Mm -hmm. now we think so to a point right so i think but going further than that is you know pure speculation we listened to another podcast with todd coombs yeah this is on the way up this is on the way up yeah (laughs) uh it's on the nebraska furniture mart podcast yeah i think it's called i am home yep and uh, really worth the listen. He said that he goes and talks to Munger every Sunday mm-hmm. about investing. Yeah. So he reads. He said he reads 500 pages a week. Yep. And it used to be. It look. It looks different now than it used to because now he reads. It's all on Geico. Right. So it's 500 pages of Geico material every week. Every week that he's reading. But when he's talking about his investments, uh, that's on the weekend. Yeah. And he goes and he talks to Munger every Sunday and. He said that, is it 99%? 99%. In this podcast, he said that 99% of what they focus on on a business is qualitative. Right. Not quantitative. Yeah. And I think Buffett and Munger have said the majority of their conversations revolve around moats. Right. And what do those lo- moats look like mm-hmm. and how sustainable are those moats and mm-hmm. whatnot. So the fact that they're looking at that just speaks to me of how much they value that compounding machine Mm -hmm. they don't want to see any interruption to that compounding machine and because that's what makes you wealthy in the end yeah and he said that a few months ago buffett said in an interview he said one reason why he's made so much money is because he's been blessed with a 90 years of longevity right right if you only live till 60 you're not going to say see that same wealth and compounding that he has that long life has attributed to it and that's really just not in his hands that is not not his yeah yeah no not at all and so I, I think at the end of the day, though, you know, when looking at a business, again, look for one of those businesses where that compounding machine is just going to keep going for years and years and years. Yeah. That's the most important part. 
So speaking of moats, maybe this will be our last point for today. One of the things that got brought up at the meeting is, is it just kind of helps you get into the thinking when they're looking at a business or at least a product that a business sells is how does it make people feel? That was a comment that we actually pontificated a lot together when right. we drove home. Yeah, we talked a lot about that. And it's very important to them. Like, what does the product do for the customer? Mm -hmm. So, and how does it make them feel? Mm -hmm. So, for instance, you know, when you crack a Coca-Cola, what does that do for the customer? Right, usually you're either out at a restaurant with friends right. or... It's giving you some sort of a good, you know, good vibe, so to speak. On top of that, the sugar gives you a high dopamine, <laughs> right, all of that. Right. Yeah. When you open an Apple phone, you know, when mm -hmm. you first get that Apple phone, what does that do for the person, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, you can just see the pricing power that Apple has there just on the basis that their stuff works. It makes people feel good to use it. And then there's a certain, I don't know, je ne sais quoi about having right. an Apple phone, you know, that's kind of baked into the human psyche. Right. How does the product make their customer feel they they yeah, and apple does a good job no one salivates over an android no one no. no one's posting their brand new pixel on ig you know right but they'll post their brand new iphone mm -hmm. and so i mean if you look at kind of the some of the businesses that they've acquired in the past you can you can kind of see that again coca-cola he's spoken a lot of that about you know c's candy especially is mm -hmm. one that he's kind of waxed eloquent on that he's like when you buy c's candy you know how does it make someone feel mm -hmm. right to give that to somebody else, right. right? These are given at special occasions. You know, you buy, you know, a C's candy box for, you know, your girlfriend or for, you know, you're meeting your girlfriend's parents and you buy the C's right. candy and you bring it to them and, you know, it's special, right. you know, between them. And they look for that a lot. Another uh, company they mentioned was Tiffany's. Tiffany's, yes. Definitely the feels. Mm -hmm. They look for the feels, like how does the company make one feel? Feel, right. The experience for the the customer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, part of that is going to depend on the industry, but mm -hmm. in a in a consumer discretionary business, mm -hmm. I think they look for that. Well, a those lot. are also some of the biggest, most powerful companies. Yeah. I mean, look at LVMH right now. Right. Right. Those brands make people feel important. Yeah. And that goes back to Todd Coombs saying, ninety nine percent of what we talk about is qualitative. What we focus on is qualitative, and it goes back to Buffett saying, most of our conversation every day revolves around moats. Right. Well, even think of Charlie Munger's holding Costco. Well, mm -hmm. how do you feel when you go into Costco? Well, I mean, you get overwhelmed by crowds. That's how I feel oftentimes. But I keep going back. Why? I see deals, mm -hmm. and I see, I see products that I like. Mm -hmm. You know, and and so you leave feeling good. You leave feeling good. You save so much money. Yeah, you look at your, you know, what you spent on groceries there, and you realize that you saved a huge whack of money. And then what you saved, you probably bought like a kayak there, or right, some you know, ridiculous. You bought something else that you didn't really need. Yeah. <laughs> but again, oftentimes people are. Pretty, for the most part, happy when they go to Costco, yeah. funny enough, even well, those crazy lines. people are willing to put up with the crowd. Right. Like you can't even find parking when you go there. No, but And we people keep going are back. willing to go there. So it obviously does something for the customer. Right. Like, there's something about the experience of Costco that they enjoy, that they would keep, keep going, going back. back. Yeah. And they're really great at identifying that. Yes. And I think that's, again, made the difference for them yeah. in their investments. And I think that's what separates them. Like anyone can run numbers. Anyone can do a DCF. Anyone can mm -hmm. learn accounting. Yeah. But I think one of the things that separates Berkshire from other investors is their ability to really figure out the companies that the have that. Mm -hmm. The moat. They can really nail down the moat. Yeah. And, and again, don't interrupt that compounding mm -hmm. machine. Again, interrupting that compounding machine you know, is, is, is what kills it. And so identify a company with moats and don't overpay. Don't overpay. Bottom line. And don't interrupt the compounding and don't machine. don't interrupt the compounding machine. Yeah. Even if the stock drops a little bit. Exactly. Add more. So there's obviously more that we would love to discuss, but I think that's long enough for today. So why don't we okay. wrap it up there and then we'll do a part two with anything else that we think that we would love to talk about. Sure. Sounds good to me. All right.